Hello, everyone. Welcome today. Um, I'm Julia Henderson, and I am coming to you today from what settlers call Vancouver, British Columbia. Hi, Ula. Um, which is on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Coast Salish First Nations people here. <clears throat> So today we have an exciting panel and we are going to start off with um, Susanna Sanchez's uh, pr um, presentation called Never Use the A Word in Eilish Negrevna's Little Red and Other Stories uh, and the New Narratives of Aging. So Susanna is a researcher at the um, Ulysses Research Center for English and American Studies at the University of Lisbon in the fields of women's and aging studies. She's a visiting scholar at the New Maynooth Ireland and University College Dublin working on Irish women's contemporary writing. Her research interests include gerontology, Irish and British literature and culture, diaspora studies, feminisms, gender and identity studies, and she's a member of Rome and the Medical Humanities Projects and steers various programs on aging. She teaches at the Department of English Studies at the University of Lisbon and is the principal investigator of the women and aging towards equality, dignity and improvement of life and well-being project. So uh, thank you so much and I will now turn it over to Susanna. Oh, right. Thank you very much, um, um, Julia, for, for your very kind introduction. And um, I'm going to um, share um, um, an introductory slide with you from my PowerPoint. Before that, I would just like to show you oh, that, that's, that's turned well, upside down. But anyway, that's the uh, book that I'm going to be, the, the collection of short stories I'm going to be speaking about. In fact, I'm going to be speaking about the first short story, the opening short story, Little Red, but that's the very book that was uh, um, published uh, not so long ago. And now I'm going to share my screen as well. Um, it's coming on. I hope, I hope you can all see the um, the title. Um, there you go, um, uh, Elish Nikrivna, um, Little Red and Other Stories. And as, as you were saying, um, the new narratives of aging. Um, so <clears throat> the um, growing interest in the interdisciplinary field of aging studies testifies to the need to revisit cultural representations of aging considering aging not only as part of the life force, but as a social and cultural construct. Um, from a feminist perspective, cultural literary gerontology makes sense because statistically speaking, uh, women live longer than men and are more affected by stereotyping due to gender inequality. Based on traditional guidelines on re-productivity, um, that is reproductivity and productivity at the same time, some popular beliefs hold that old age starts when we reach our sixth decade, where youth ends, in women's case, with the onset of uh, uh, menopause. However, ontologically weak these arguments may be, even if they were considered true, there's no tangible explanation of what happens to a person during the 10 years in between. And just to quote uh, from Charlotte Bronte, um, who many, many years ago um, was quoted to, 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 see, to say, I'm not 32, youth's gone, gone, and will never come back, can help it, and, and quote. Um, <clears throat> so, as I was saying, um, old age as any other category, linguistic category and cultural category is a social construct and is defined in terms of obligations, in this case, of what a person should or should not be, as well as of, unfortunately, a lack. So in this research, we recognize that aging is a contextual perspective-based term, which is also often negatively associated with decline and many stereotypes. We also draw attention to the fact that aging is a lifelong process and that signs of aging affect individual women at different stages in the life course. Accordingly, age, ranging from middle age to the fourth age, 
aforementioned in, in the previous session, has an impact on how prevalent cultural notions of getting old or the cult of youth can influence younger women's self-perceptions. Um, and I'm here referring to, um, all, for instance, um, Simone de Beauvoir uh, and her um, 70s uh, statement, 60s, 70s statement, uh, the horror of growing old. So the negative constructions of the aging woman are common across multiple cultural contexts and include the sexualized aging woman as a sort of disgust or a commodified female body and are very often reflected in language. Furthermore, women's feelings about their aging bodies are often conflicting and distorted. Women are reluctant to give um, in to the stereotypes on one hand and to engage uh, with them on the other. This accentuates the disconnection between the aging body and the aging subject, not only in what the body is, <clears throat> uh, but also what the body is capable of. Fed by the negative definitions of aging, there exists a cultural obsession with the concealment of the visual, visual manifestations of aging. All these concerns can be discerned in representations of for aging women in popular culture, celebrity culture, literature, film, television, you name it. And yet the aging women's experience, one that has um, up until um, relatively recently received little critical attention. Um, little has been said uh, <clears throat> about the apparent lack that can be queered into a surplus as American writer Penelope Lively writes, um, uh, we are um, invisible, we all the women, we are invisible, what we are not, we are not invisible, sorry, but we are not seen. And I, my belief is that this ambivalent and paradoxical statement can open new doors for the already elastic category of aging. In 1972, Susan Sontag's Susan Sontag published The Double Standard of, Standard of Aging in the Saturday Review, in which she lamented that the, and I quote, is a double standard of aging that denounces women with special severity. Society is much more permissive about aging in men, end quote. In the years uh, following Sontag's publication, aging was a topic largely absent from feminist discourse until the appearance of Germaine Gris, the change women aging and the menopause in 1991. Greer's critique of the medical establishment's treatment of the menopause was groundbreaking. Unlike her predecessors, Greer celebrates um, the onset of old age in women as an, and she calls it an avenue of freedom. As a woman looks uh, received, she's no longer culturally constructed as a sexual object and now unwanted, um, um, the aging woman can be free. So the contemporary Irish writer, Elish Negrivna has been writing her award-winning fiction for a few decades now, and has uh, taken to writing specifically about women and aging. She recently edited a volume gathering uh, stories from different older Irish women writers, apart from the very one that I'm talking about today, but there's another one that came last year, came out last year, and it's entitled, look, it's a woman writer, Irish literary feminisms, 1970, 2020. In Little Red and Other Stories, uh, the very volume that I'm speaking about today, published by the Black Staff Press in 2020, Nigrivna chooses to give voice to what afflicts aging women and to how they grapple with their new realities. The problems that repeat themselves throughout the stories are the desiccation of relationships, widowhood, oncology, all women experience aging with the same intensity and struggle to overcome the process. We saw trauma dem democratically distributed and we witnessed agency under different forms and personal manifestos being deployed to tally with the challenging and intense phase of aging. Suddenly the aging woman, uh, women sorry, are not a mass of nameless cancer patients, divorcees and widows, they still experience um, <clears throat> anxiety, uh, but they also experience life or existence soaked with energy to travel, to learn and to forge new relationships, um, or to use language in a different way, 
And so in Nigrivna, the horror of aging is electrifying and eroticized. And her women are bursting with tension, fear, loss, and the uh, revival of what uh, French feminism um, calls joissance. In Little Red, an opening short story of the collection, the main character Fiona, who works in the book trade, I quote, is traveling uh, back from Dublin um, to um, Lisbon, where she had been at a conference, something to do with work, and quote, Fiona, who, and I quote, observes the cliched rule, don't engage in conversations with a fellow passenger until 20 minutes before landing, end quote, is reading a book by um, Rachel Kask. Um, and I quote here the description of the very author, a sort of autofiction, autofiction novel, the very um, latest fashion, hip, a hybrid card of a written word, end quote. Contrary to Kask, Fiona does not like to share stories. Uh, and I quote again, she didn't want to pay the price, and quote, of listening to the uninteresting stories. And yet she's inevitably changed by the words of the intrusive Molly, um, who sits uh, in, the, in the seat next to her on the plane, on the plane. Fiona, and I quote, possesses stories who does not, but it goes against her nature to confine in strangers and most other people as well, end quote. Yet her narrative, Fiona's narrative, is soon changed by the very hybrid card of a word against her expertise and wisdom. Um, <clears throat> in, and then here, I would like to um, uh, take the liberty and compare this very expression, uh, um, a hybrid card of a word, to what Alice Smith um, uh, um, <clears throat> uses as traveling etymologies in her fiction, um, something that allows for multiple and subjective interpretations. Um, a word that can um, um, uh, mold to different cultural and linguistic concepts. Other people's narratives, if we are open to their operations, can entirely change the course of our own life. And the very action of inviting the other can be an act of agency and courage, qualities that are denied to aging women that, are, <clears throat> that for centuries were unwelcome um, in girls' education, something that was um, clearly reflected in um, um, type of fiction that was, that was, uh, that was um, uh, uh, available for growing uh, uh, up girls. While being a controversial writer and figure, Rachel Kask is usually seen as an extraordinary example of skillful communication with the other, of what defines a narrative approach to identity, of skillful people-oriented listening that does not judge or interpret. She not only listens attentively, um, but translate, tra translates sorry, the reality of the other to give energy to her own existence. She's a loud speaker to the other's voice and the receptor of the narrative, uh, uh, of the other's narrative vitality. Her narrators exist as long as the other is speaking, yet asks for no explanations. Um, and quoting here from one of um, um, Kask's uh, novels, I did not have the blind belief in reality that made others ask for conc concrete explanations. This is something that um, Kask's uh, um, first person narrator, Faye, says um, um, in the novel entitled Transit. In the line with Faye, Fiona, here in the case of Nigrivna, becomes more fluid, uh, and <clears throat> which leads her to having to face the other in her narrative, an unexpected guest in her house. Like Kask Nigrivna, abandons the fantasy of fixation and a stagnation for her aging characters. She projects them as dynamic, traveling, sharing, and confronting with the reality of the other. And um, <clears throat> a good listener, Kask's narrator, has an additional capacity of adaptation to and of the other story. 
she not so much queers it, but makes space for signification. And it seems to me that a similar playful attempt can be seen in Nigrivna. There's not a corner she will not investigate when it comes to older women's lives in relation to their past and the present. Her voice is ruminating and open to the other. She wants to uh, listen to women when they are afflicted by retirement, divorce, when they become widowed in later life. The narrative Fiona in Little Red sheds space, actually sheds space on a plane with um, ubiquitous surplus embodiment um, of femininity over Bengali cliched character Molly Kashi, whose ubiquitous um, uh, <clears throat> sorry, embodiment makes her become a caricature version of Joycean Molly Bloom. Fiona herself is no less affected by her divorce that takes her to experimenting with online dating, uh, dating sorry, and confronting herself with both male and female aging body and desire. The Trousers Brigade is what Molika she recommends Fiona tries uh, because being past 60 is by no means a reason not to search for a male partner, in this case, against the threat of loneliness. And indeed, Fiona does venture into online dating. And the very short story starts um, with a sentence, a thing that Fiona does is online dating, but ends up being stuck Fiona into her own house. As we readers, we are aware that the 64 year old Fiona is in the mid middle of a life crisis, as I was saying, recently left by her husband of 30 years for a younger woman and now reestablishing herself as an independent agent of her new life. At the same time, she's adjusting to the internal and external challenges of aging that we as readers and Fiona as the subject of her narrative constructs through words, um, the language we use on everyday basis, um, the language of the A word. It is also through the use of the new words and symbols that Fiona, an avid reader and public speaker, gains agency, that she gains agency over the other, her family, other aging people she randomly meets, and above all, her new romantic partners, representatives of the dominant culture, men. To Fiona, communicating with men through messages, um, either, of either of long sentences or of symbols, is a new experience of empowerment. She winks at men with emojis, waves at them, and is bold to use the communication tools not only available to the opposite gender, and above all, it's her who takes the initiative to talk and to let men in without saying much. She also learns that using the culturally embedded A word, supposedly standing for aging, would inevitably present aging as uh, here autonomous, uh, 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 sorry, autonomous to beautiful, independent and desirable so that she rewrites the narratives that she uses. She even invents different versions of the classic tale um, read the Little Red Riding Hood, where there is a totally unexpected ending, one that distorts the logic of a classic cautionary tale, but is well accepted by Fiona's granddaughter, Ellie. Fiona had never rung the bell in a plane before for anything, even through the flies, uh, as, even though she flies several times a year, but she rang it and got a second little bottle of red is a quote from the short story. And so on the plane, Molly tells Fiona, it's time for you to meet somebody, she went on. That's if, if you're still interested in the trousers brigade. Fiona said, I'm 64, never used the A word. Kashi wagged her finger at her. A, age, forget it. You're a beautiful woman, end quote. We may here wonder, what does the A word stand for? Queered with the popular concept of the beautiful traditionally reserved for younger women, at 64, beauty takes on a different definition. The A word is not going to come knocking on your door. A may stand for agency, 
for the courage um, <clears throat> to embrace the horror of growing old into and change it into the joie sense of being one. Aging for all its plasticity and elusiveness is linguistically and culturally vibrant. It can inexhaustibly, uh, it can be inexhaustibly productive and able to change the established fallacies of the A word. Under the spell of her own desire, Fiona finds herself conjuring her new reality. In a magical moment, she sits during a storm with neither light or fire, and I quote, there's a storm brewing. She has come in and is sitting on her favorite chair under the lamp beside the fire, hugging a cup of coffee. The fire is not lit and neither is the lamp, end quote. After a little bit of a detective work, end quote, a man shows up at Fiona's doorstep. Is that, she wonders, Declan the plumber or Declan the electrician or Declan the serial killer, end quote. Fiona's house apparently easy to be found on Google gives you another magical reference, um, Rosamond's Bower, the name given to the um, unheimlich secret maze where allegedly King Henry II he, his beautiful and mysterious mistress, Rosamond, later, later mur uh, murdered by Henry II's wife, um, Eleanor. Whatever narrative needs to be fulfilled after Declan and Fiona meet, it is worth to notice that it requires of Fiona to have an active role in accepting its open-endedness and in being able to be more than both, alluding here again, to Alice Smith, how to be both. The grandmother and the Red Riding Hood, um, as we find out to be the tell Fiona repeatedly tells her granddaughter Ellie, alluding also to the name is elusive of um, uh, Queen Eleanor, um, how to be both. Fiona now can choose to be um, um, both the um, granddaughter and the older uh, woman. Nobody has ever dropped in two years she's been here, end quote, remembers Fiona, until Declan, Declan's mysterious arrival, uh, Declan who knocks at her door just like a cunning wolf in the Little Red Riding Hood tale. In this traditional narrative, however, the wolf swallows the grandmother only to possess the naive granddaughter and is stopped by the brave forest guide. In the Grivna's story, there's no forest guide and the wolf and the grandmother share an interest in one another, uh, partaking in the simple, in a simple, sorry, dinner Fiona prepares for both of them. Scared of her new role and drawn to Declan at the same time, Fiona is in the position to consent to the new relationship, even though she finds herself afraid of being alone with Declan. And here, um, curiosity and agency may come with a price, but it's not as scary as all the traditional cautionary tales have the little girls believe. In the end, we find out that what has until uh, now prompted the telling of the Little Red Riding Hood is Ellie's doll that can turn inside out and become either the little girl, the wolf or the grandmother. Whoever tells the narrative has the agency to become whichever character they please, a characteristic that Fiona only comes to possess in later age. The beauty and the mystery that surround Fiona come with her maturity, her independence, experience, and the capacity to be fluid enough to incarnate any role in life. Um, the Little Red Riding Hood reworks different expectations towards and of women, and <clears throat> at the same time, um, um, works on the operations of female desire. Traditional, it is an example of women as storytellers, according to Karen Rowe, and such an unusual active role allows for a symbolic engagement between aging, agency, as well as desire and joissance. Catherine Orenstein, claimed that the Little Red Riding Hood is about, and I quote, coming of age, family, self, and interrelationship. There are existing many different versions 
of the narrative, some more traditional and others more contemporary, either by Charles Perrault or Angela Carter taking the um, <clears throat> Little Red Riding Hood to be an example of a cautionary tale, Nigrivna wishes to address another specific wound in the unconscious of the society, the undesirability undes of older women, the predatory character of male desire, and the entitlement to agency long denied to older women. In the earlier versions of the narrative where patriarchal re re revisions projecting women as sub subservient, this new feminist version projects women to be active subjects of their story against the ambiguity of the A word. It is in the symbol of the Little Red Riding Hood doll that we see the explanation of Fiona is now capable of becoming as lineage from who Angela Carter projected in her narrative of sexual freedom for women, um, referring myself here to her novel, The Grandmother. By entering the interplay with Declan, she offers him food and drink and shapes, uh, sorry, uh, food and drink and thus becomes the wolf herself, just as her granddaughter's doll that changes shapes between the three characters from the tale. Fiona is now able to reinvent herself as desirable and desiring in the post-liminal stage, a theory argued by Cynthia Jones in her description of the rites of passage in the literary writing hood. In Igrivna, Fiona and Declan, both aging and agents, can now meet as equals, something that may not necessarily lead to a disaster, as seen in the improvised ending of the literary writing hood, Fiona tells Ellie, the version that's not scary, I, and I un, uh, unquote, where, and again I quote, the wolf doesn't eat the grandmother. And quoting here from the short story, so Fiona told her, Early, at the end of the tale, the wolf and the grandmother at, uh, and Red Riding Hood all sat down at the kitchen table and ate the stuff from the basket. Um, is that it? What was the point? Where was the story? And who had put such ideas into Ellie's head? That's what Fiona thought. It's not a proper story. No tension, no fear, no loss, no relief. No lack, um, no A word. The key thing is missing. Um, and yet the words have an empowering capacity. But Ellie, in the end of the short story, notes, not, sorry, apparently perfectly satisfied with what she had heard. The truth about stories is that's all we are. Thank you. Let me, thank you so much, Susanna, for that lovely presentation. Um, and we'll have a chance to have a question and answer and discussion together at the end. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Ruth Garman, who is going to deliver her paper entitled Tomorrow's Best Agers, Superheroes and Successful Aging. Ruth has just started as a postdoctoral researcher in the Collaborative Research Center on Human Differentiation at Johannes Gutenberg University of Mainz, Germany. Her research focuses on strategies of successful aging and she is about to engage in a qualitative interview study. Her PhD project focused on organ transplantation in speculative, speculative fiction. <clears throat> Here, she engaged with diverse texts and paid particular attention to how power dynamics and strategies of disenfranchisement inform the representation of transplant practices. This project also allowed her to focus on her research interests, popular culture, and the medical humanities. So now I will turn it over to Ruth, um, and we look forward to hearing. Yes, thank you so much, Julia, for that kind introduction. Today, I want to talk about superheroes, and I want to talk about aging. It might appear that these two items cannot be brought into conversation. However, recent years have seen a proliferation of aging superheroes. So I'm going to show you in my presentation, which I'm just going to share with you.
I hope everyone can see that. Please let me know if it's not visible. So we have seen a proliferation of this combination of aging superheroes. Ranging from the wrinkly and deliberately faltering body of X-Men's Logan in the film of the same name, to the powerful protagonists of Jupiter's legacy, which has just been um, put on Netflix. While in these instances, stereotypical images of old age are employed, we have wrinkles, white hair. I want to introduce another example of age and superheroes in which age is constructed via language. And I thus hope to tie into this conference's theme. Therefore, I want to focus on Steve Rogers and his role as Captain America often nicknamed Cap, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which I will abbreviate to MCU in the following. The character of Captain America first appeared in 1941 as a scrawny young man from Brooklyn who has administered a serum that turns him into an athletic super soldier. He is related to World War II as he served to increase interest in the war effort. In fact, the first uh, of the Marvel issues present him punching Adolf Hitler as you can see here. Yet Steve Rogers did not stay in the past. Shifting from comics to the cinematic universe, he awakes in 2011 after being frozen in the middle of a selfless act of sacrifice. But when Cap awakes, he discovers a changed world. In the upcoming years, he will join the Avengers and lead them through a variety of adventures. With relation to this, to his significant role in the group of heroes, it is noteworthy that Captain America is repeatedly referred to as old. This notion might not appear surprising given his birthday on the 4th of July in 1918 and Cap's deliberately portrayed alienation with the 21st century. However, God of Thunder and co-member Thor is of much higher chronological age and being from Asgard does not follow 21st century earth customs either. Yet, as is mentioned in the spin-off series of Luke Cage, Captain America is the old dude with a shield. So why is he admonished as being old? And in extension, what does calling him old entail, both about the suggestive adjective and the character it is applied to? While Captain America has found critical attention, prominently with regard to nationalist tendencies and portrayals of race, I aim at drawing attention to the overlooked aspect that lies at the core of Steve Rogers' existence, his role as old. Given that Steve is presented as a hyper able-bodied and overly masculine white man, and just a short um, example of this. So this is him stopping a helicopter with his, uh, just with his body basically. Um, and just an interesting fun fact, the, you can see his biceps, which is, is bulging. And in online discussion, people actually talked about whether his biceps was CGI made um, or real. And um, it is actually Chris Evans, so the actor's biceps. So we can see that even the actor of Captain America is sort of um, read in terms of able-bodiedness and physical prowess. So um, I want to argue that he does not relate to the aging process uh, physically. Rather, the term old serves as a double role. It appears as a means of, denunci of denunciation and dismissal on the one hand, yet it also serves to underline the significance and ultimately timeless quality of values portrayed by Captain America. Hereby, I suggest the political significance of being read as old and its impact on group dynamics. In order to trace this line of thought, I will first briefly introduce the concept of old and aging studies, and then discuss three scenes in which Cap is referred to as old. Here, I only refer to Marvel Cinematic Universe's depiction of Captain America, given that the comic versions can greatly deviate. So prominently, Captain America has died uh, in the comic versions in 2007. So before sketching the use of old with regard to Captain America, I want to briefly repeat key elements of the term that will be of importance in my discussion and that will probably be known to many of you. With regard to aging, Anita Wohlmann wonders whether aging appears on a spectrum in which the markers of young and old are flexible and situational. However, despite this notion of aging as fluid, aging tends to be assessed in binaries. The term old in particular holds specific connotations that I assess as being important for my reading of the films. 
being old comprises both physical and social components. components. Physically, old tends to be tied to ill or declining health. In her influential Aged by Culture, Margaret Morgan was Goulet underlines this notion. She emphasizes that aging equals decline. And even Seneca explains that old age is a disease. Socially, being old is tied to exclusion, loneliness, and even insignificance. It is important to note that old, in contrast to, for instance, wise or experience, also holds the potential of mental incapacity that implies a specific notion of unfitness. Consider, for instance, recurring news reports wondering whether Joe Biden is too old for office. Being old then clearly appears in a specific cultural context, as Rüdiger Kuno summarizes, when understanding old age as an attribution that produces actions and reactions, and who claims that it always takes two to age. Countering this image of advanced age as decay, Roe and Kahn have promoted notions of successful aging, a term that unsurprisingly opens a set of inquiries, such as if one can age successfully, how might one age unsuccessfully? Can successful aging be disentangled from structural inequality and markers such as gender, race, disability, and class? Susan Sontag, as was already uh, mentioned by Suzanne just now, for instance, has emphasized that aging is not the same across the gender spectrum. And yesterday's talks, I think, have established the impossibility to separate aging from matters of race and class and also disability. Perceiving of the terms excluding potential, both with regard to health and society, I want to engage with Captain America, particularly because he does not adhere to any of the aspects typically tied to aging. He is physically extremely fit. He is not socially excluded and clearly remains a valid member of society. In effect, Steve Rogers can pass as a young person, the ultimate successful ager. So now I want to move on to my first example. Um, and I just want to briefly introduce the setting um, so everyone can, can join who might not have seen the film. This clip is from the Avengers, the first Avengers film from 2012. And the film's villain Loki, Loki who is the god of mischief and the brother, brother to the Avenger Thor, has just been taken in. Captain America is having a conversation with Tony Stark, who is Iron Man, who he has just met for the first time. So Iron Man is another Avenger. Iron Man is known for his technological know-how, intelligence, and wit. I'm just going to show, I hope everyone can see that. Again, please let me know if not. Uh, I like it. What, Rock of Asia has given up so easily, no one ever did. What do you think, lies? What? It's like, you might have missed a couple times. Many times, capsicle. Fury didn't tell me he was calling you in. Yeah, there's a lot of things Fury doesn't tell you. That's a the, the transcript of the scene in case you couldn't follow. What we can take away from that scene with regard to Captain... So what we can we take away from that scene with regard to Captain America being old? Tony Stark remarks that, remarks that he is an older fellow, yet is still pretty spry. Hereby, he deliberately correlates Cap's physical prowess to his understanding of him as old. Rather than referring to Captain America's act of self-sacrifice that led to him being frozen for decades, Stark calls him a capsicle, a pun to the frozen popsicle. The reference to Pilates, Pilates and thus to current forms of physical exercise, which are decidedly unmasculine and non-combative, is given specific punch by Captain America's non-reaction. As a viewer, we might feel inclined to wonder, does Captain America catch the reference? Or has he in fact lost step with ongoing developments? This notion is indicated by his earlier mentioning of not remembering, thereby relating to a time long gone. These initial notes present Iron Man's banter as a means for comic relief. However, read in the scene's context, his use of older fellow and his attempt at ridiculing Cap lends itself to discussion of power dynamics. Captain's remark that it was too easy to bring Loki in will prove to be correct in the film's future developments. Yet Stark's answer, his reduction of Steve Rogers to an older fellow, leads to the dismissal of the former's doubt. It is obvious that Rogers is aware that he is being dismissed, 
because he immediately re refers to Nick Fury, who is in fact the, uh, is working for S.H.I.E.L.D. and has basically cast all Avengers. So he's referring to authority here. Stark's final comment that Rogers does not know all that Nick Fury does further establishes that they are actually talking about who is in charge here. And in fact, not about age. Stark's reference to Rogers' age then appears as a means of illegitimization. Rather than engaging with Captain America's doubts concerning Loki, Iron Man dismisses him by referring to him being old. Hereby, the term old appears as a means to exclude from leadership and to reduce agency in effect. Moving on from this first example to my second example, I again want to briefly address the setting and where we are in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the MCU. This example is taken from the Avengers 2 film, Age of Ultron from 2015. In it, the group faces an artificial intelligence as a villain, Ultron. And Ultron was in fact created by Tony Stark himself, yet has become independent and obviously harmful to, to the Avengers cause of protecting the world. The example comprises two very short clips. The first one serves as the background and the second as the actual scene I want to discuss. In the first scene, we see the Avengers discussing how they may, might face future threats. That's the end game. How are you guys planning on beating that? Together. We'll lose. And we'll do that together too. Thor's right. So here we see Steve Rogers talking to Tony Stark again. While Stark relates to the feasibility of their cause, Rogers appears to primarily refer to a communal, communal spirit and to core American value. Together, the group of heroes will both stand and fall. Hereby, Captain America appears as the super soldier he was created to be. He is the one rallying the groups and bringing them to fight, rather than being the strongest Avenger himself. So let's move on to the second scene in the same film in which the word old actually appears. This is Ultron who's speaking to them. This is the best I can do. This is exactly what I wanted. All of you against all of me. How can you possibly hope to stop me? Like the old man said, together. <laughs> So again, this is the short transcript because not that much has been spoken. Here, Tony Stark is quoting Captain America. When facing the impossible onslaught of machinery, he suggests that they will stop them together. I want to draw attention to the fact that first, Tony calls him the old man. As I want to illustrate how this employment of the term might differ from its use in the first example. First of all, calling him an old man might appear as a term of endearment. Their banter has become friendly and does not hinder Stark from taking Roger seriously. Yet, I want to suggest that calling him old in that moment presents a deliberate opposition to the technology the group faces. While typically Stark would solve problems with his own use of specified technology, he is Iron Man after all, this approach might just be challenged by the experience of technology run amok in the case of Ultron. Now, Stark relates back to the values embodied by Rogers, fighting and possibly dying together. The old in this sentence then still relates to the untimeliness of Steve's existence, yet at, yet at the same time, it appears as validation. Captain America's insistence on them fighting together and their shared cause leads to the group's successes. This notion is prominently emphasized in the following fight scene in which each of the hero's strengths are featured separately. Hereby, the film suggests that the traditional value established by the old man's together is in fact worthwhile and the only thing keeping Western values against the faceless, soulless evil presented by Ultron. Even though old might appear as a dismissive comment, it is thus, th thus actually granted an alternative, alternative meaning in this context. Hereby, it is suggested that Rogers being old is acceptable when applied to his classic American values. However, 
It is important to note that these values don't reflect his 1940s background, but rather what the 21st century would like American ideals to have been. Consider, for instance, that Captain America does not utter racist slurs, and he's also, uh, he also encourages the female Black widow to fight with them. Nevertheless, concerning the Avengers ideals, I want to briefly quote a podcast of my hometown theater, which suggests that we are still waiting for the first gay Avenger. So being called old then signifies Captain America's relation to traditional universal American ideals. Rather than discouraging his claim to power, it presents him as the group's conscious and an extension, I would say its leader. Moving on to my last example, I'm also moving on to the last Avengers film, Endgame from 2019, which also ended the last phase, the fourth phase of the M MCU. In the film, the group faces Thanos, who has vanished half of the creatures in the universe. And in order to fight the overpowering enemy and bring those who have disappeared back, the Avengers actually have to travel through time, visiting an array of alternate timelines. In the film's end, Captain America is shown again. However, he is visibly aged, his hair is white, his face wrinkled, and he thus aligns to standardized readings of old age. Well, that's right. Put the stones back, I thought. Maybe I'll try some of that by Tony. Tell me to get. Yeah. Truly. Thank you. The only thing bumming me out is the fact that I have to live in a world without Captain America. Oh. And that bums me. Try not. That's it again, the transcript, maybe it was a bit uh, unclear here, what was being said. So this scene, which breaks with the theory of alternate timelines, um, not important at that point, but um, annoying nevertheless, presents Captain America visibly aged, even sitting overlooking a lake, um, kind of like someone who might be feeding ducks or something. So I think like very much a cliched idea of someone, someone being old. Um, as Sam Wilson, known uh, as the Falcon in the MCU, approaches, Cat immediately refers to Tony Stark. So it seems that his role in how Rogers lives his life remains palpable. The conversation is revealing when it comes to age and Captain America. Firstly, for once, his status as old has finally caught up with his external appearance. Now, as visibly aged, he looks back on his life. Using the past tense, it was beautiful. Even though Rogers is still alive, his age removes him from the events he has and continues to experience. Secondly, Wilson's comment clearly disassociates Rogers from Captain America. Aside from alluding to Rogers leaving the world for good by dying, Wilson suggests that looking the way Rogers does, it is impossible for him to stay Captain America. While Captain America's role is defined by his reference to what can be read as traditional American values, it is thus still his physical constitution that makes it impossible for Rogers to stay in the role. With it, while the first two examples have presented Steve's status as old, either as a tool to dismiss or to promote the significance of his ideas, this last example illustrates that while Captain America might be old fashioned in mind, he can never be old in body. In conclusion, I understand Captain America as an exemplary cause a case for a key question of aging studies, namely the cultural and linguistic construction of aging. Captain America being called old emphasizes that, that the term holds the potential to dismiss someone, but also to recognize and appreciate the longevity of a person's ideals. Here, the, the political potential of the term is revealed as the construction of him as the old man also relies on his almost unwavering support of American ideals. As Thomas Vogat argues, 
Captain America pledges his loyalty to American political ideas rather than to American political leaders. As tech-savvy Tony Stark prominently challenges Steve Rogers by calling him old, the term signifies a struggle of agency and opposition between knowledge systems. It is no coincidence that Stark validates Rogers once his reliance on technology fails him. In the end, then, the use of old also reveals a key conflict in the Avengers franchise. How can Captain America's ideals survive when his exceptionalism also needs to be perceived as a problem? It is no coincidence that in the last installment of the Avengers, Captain America thus appears as a visibly old man. His exterior has finally caught up and his young body becomes a mere mask for his inner status as old. It might also not be a coincidence that many have remarked on old Captain America's resemblance to Joe Biden, as this deep fake emphasizes, a man who after all has been presented as being too old for office. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth, for that enlightening uh, <clears throat> presentation on the Marvel Universe. Um, yeah, having seen those films, it was really interesting to hear your analysis. Um, so now we'll open it up to our, our question period. Um, we have a little bit of time, about eight minutes or so. So I would invite anyone um, to offer your questions. You can either do it through the chat or Q&A. Or, um, you know, we don't have a lot of uh, people in the audience. So if you are able to and want to come on camera, you're welcome to come on and ask your question as well. Um, so uh, we also, um, uh, Ruth and Susanna, I would love to invite you to ask questions of each other or make comments on each other's talk as well, if that is um, something that come, you have something that comes to mind you want to offer. Um, so just opening up, is there anyone, anyone have a question to start out? Uh, nothing in the chat or Q&A. Well, if, if I could, I could, I could say something just to count yeah. in. Um, thank you again very much, um, Ruth, wonderful talk. Thanks very much for all your insight as well. I, I, I really enjoyed listening to you, especially um, something you said at the very end of your presentation when you were saying the getting all uh, you can be getting old uh, um, or, or better getting old is a psychological or mental concept rather than getting old in your body because you can still retain all the bodily capacities <laughs> until i don't know how long and that that gets us into fantasy and fiction and the cyborgs we're creating you know and recreating our body and and opens you know space for for further discussion on on on, on utopia and and whatever it means to what so, and what sort of extensions of our body we are able to to have to to add a bit of longevity um but but really it's it's true right because we are talking about language here in this in, in this gathering over these two days and 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 aging and getting old is about uh language and 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 the mind in and and it's an actual actually intellectual concept as well, right? <laughs> Not only, but absolutely. Thank you. I think it's so interesting because you also sort of refer to this idea of which tales do we use as a basis, right? For sort of like in the in this case a fairy tale um, basis. Um, so it seems to me that there are all all of these different narratives that sort of underline uh, the idea how we walk through life and so forth, and also how we conceive of our own of our bodies, our minds in, in relation to to time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it was really interesting how you both um, talked about stereotypes. And when we think of stereotypes, like I know personally anyways, I very much think of visual stereotypes and you know the visuality of that. And you were really reflecting on how the stereotypes influence language and, and how it can, the language itself can reiterate stereotypes or can be used to contest them. Um, so I don't know if you want to, but if you have any further reflections on that, I would love to hear. 
Well, uh, not not if if I may I may say something, and uh, not not directly here, Alicia Negrivna, but Alice Smith, whom I quoted as well in my in my presentation, she has quite a lot to say about language and how it reflects uh, reality with her with with her um, etymology of words, a traveling etymology, uh, as she may uh, as she may call it, and she very often uh, comes up with examples of 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 English words that change over time, and now how they reflected, you know. Uh, the the perception perception of visual reality. Uh, oh well, let me think of a word now. Um, bosom, for instance, you know uh, the word that used to uh, be used uh, to both men and women, and that would uh, basically we refer to somebody who was passive, and who was very. Uh, um, um, uh, reserved and 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 you know um, relaxed and 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 and, and uh, not at all uh, assertive in in this very masculine sense. And over time, you know, we we see how this word started to be applied to um, uh, first uh, people who had weight problems, and then. Um, I mean, and we're talking about the 18th, 17th, 18th century, 19th century. So even if you say, uh, look at uh, art history and see the paintings and, and the ideal of beauty, we see, for instance, the female subjects, um, uh, say a paint, Rubens painting and all of that. So this very word bosom was being applied to both men and women, but who were meek and sensitive and fragile and reserved. And then it went on to describing we, uh, people, first people who had weight problem because uh, such was the stereotype that people with, with greater weight would be more passive than those who were more athletic. And then, you know, very, very slowly, this word started to be applied to women and to, 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 to women. And then what femininity meant, you know, stereotypical femininity meant how women were supposed to look. And we ended up and, 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 and having women with, 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 with sizable breasts and, and we're turning totally male gaze and, and visual and, and, and patriarchal as, as, as much as you can get. <laughs> there's no, there's no um, uh, running away from it. And, and so Alice Smith is quite good and, and coming up with these examples and how over centuries they, they simply reflect our reality. Thank you. Um, so you have a question from Linda uh, in the chat. I'll just read it out. And uh, we're just about two minutes away from time, but we'll go over time for about five minutes to just um, extend our discussion a little bit. So Linda says, I was also really struck by the notion of retelling stories with the difference and about adaptations and the possibilities that opens up. Whether it's from comics to film or playing with fairy tales, I like the potential in this to call our attention also to expectations. Who are superheroes? How does that story go and how they might be challenged? Um, so I guess that's just her reflection. But if you have further comments on that, um, I would love to hear them. Um, maybe Ruth, if you have anything to add, I'll invite you to go first. Yes, um, th I think that's a very sort of very um, interesting um, observation or just comment there. Um, it makes me think about the way that sort of Captain America has evolved in, in recent years beyond. And that's sort of what I think addressed shortly in the beginning. There's this gap now between our filmic idea of Captain America and the comic version of Captain America, because he died in 2007, spoiler alert, but um, there's also this, this, I think it's Brubaker who, who made that comic strip of Captain America going to Afghanistan, right, and, and serving there. And uh, this idea of problematization of the role of Captain America, I think that's very fascinating. I don't, I'm not, not sure it, it very much refers to age, but it's just something that comes to my mind when I, when I heard that comment. The idea of how can we actually sort of have this idea of American exceptionalism uh, when political agendas have become um, problematic. And uh, yeah, sorry. Hope that's not too far off our topic. No, no need to be sorry at all. Uh, Susanna, would you like to add anything? Well, well, uh, I would simply want to say that um, uh, that's actually very true. I mean, what happens to Captain America, and, and that's related to, as you were saying, Ruth, the American agenda. 
but also in terms of women, right? Um, is there anything we have to arrive at? Is there anything we have to become, right? Because uh, uh, the potential itself, I mean, there's a potential to, uh, um, to, to, to become something, but there isn't, a, there isn't necessarily a potential for um, uh, becoming a leader, the leader, the winner, the, um, the wolf, uh, somebody who ends up having an upper hand over other people, right? There's something totally contrary to what aging, I think, uh, could be and how it could be seen and, uh, uh, um, and, and well, um, reinvented in a sense that there isn't anything we have to become. <laughs> Right, there, because that, that, that goes on situating ourselves in this um, male-female stereotypes and the power and lack of power kind of relationship. So the potential is there. It doesn't have to necessarily lead to becoming uh, the winner, right? Yeah. The survivor. Yeah, really, right. I think it's really interesting what you're saying because it, it, I think, ties into the idea of an abandonment of the idea of successful aging, right? Yeah. So the idea of who win lose what would success even constitute yeah 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 that's the binary that that, that maybe doesn't really make sense in terms of aging mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you for that um one other thing that came to my mind um that i found really interesting uh out of your talk Susanna, was your mention how the character i think is it fiona the older woman fiona yeah yeah, yeah um, fiona. was doing online dating and um was getting used to doing it, texting with symbols and emojis and I was just thinking how interesting to think you know we usually think about language as spoken language or as traditional written language but these new languages of social media and what that they mean to um, experiences of aging and being older um, I don't know if you have any reflections on that but it just it was something that I hadn't considered before Right. I mean, yeah, these are our new tools for, for intercultural communication and whatever we're doing with, with words, right? Um, um, and, and, and well, uh, wonderful if we can see, uh, um, you know, the, the, the third or fourth generation that we were uh, uh, talking about in the previous session, uh, you know, embracing these, these, these very tools because, um, I mean, uh, uh, um, well, that, 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 that there's, there's, there's quite a lot that, that, that these, these things are offered to people, especially when it comes to anonymity, right? And, 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 and um, obviously there are, there are negative and, and positive aspects of that. But in terms of aging, that's like totally um, getting a blank page again and being able to communicate with other people from a totally different perspective. Thank you. Um, Ruth, do you have any final words before we wrap up? Um, oh, God. Uh, no, I feel no challenged. pressure. No pressure. <laughs> I just want to offer you the opportunity. <laughs> thank you. Just, well, thank you for having me. It's been great. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you thank both you. for your enlightening presentations. I found them uh, very rich and I so was interested in your reflections on, on stereotypes and those sort of stock figures and how they are either reiterated or challenged through um, the various uh, forms um, and, and structures and how uh, the language is embedded in that. So thank you so much. Um, for everyone, I just want to mention that um, the meet and greet session follows immediately. Um, I guess it's open now and Amber has put the link in the chat for that. It's a different link from this one. So uh, look forward hopefully to seeing you there and then we'll recommence with our sessions following the meet and greet. Thank you so much, everyone. And Thank you very much. Thank you. See you in, Thank in you. a oh.